On the broadcast tonight, out of prison, a convicted terrorist blamed for the deaths of 270 people in the Lockerbie bombing is set free. But why? Kennedy's wish, though terminally ill, the senator looks to the future and makes a request. Driving a bargain, a major development in the Cash for Clunkers program as it nears the end of the road. And growth industry, teenagers helping others put food on the table. They are young people making a difference. Also tonight, what today's new rules on credit cards will mean for you. Nightly news begins now. From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. Good evening. In for Brian Williams, I'm Ann Curry. One of the world's most notorious terrorists convicted in the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103, which killed 270 people, most of them Americans, is free tonight and home in Libya. A private plane sent by Libya's President Muammar Gaddafi carried Abdel Basset Ali Al Magrahi to a hero's welcome in Tripoli. Scotland announced this morning it was releasing him for compassionate reasons and then steeled itself for outrage which came. NBC's Donna Friesen now joins us from outside the prison where Ali Amograhi was held in Greenwich, Scotland. Donna. Good evening, and he spent just eight years of a life sentence here in this Scottish prison, and tonight, Abdul Basset al-Magrahi left here a free man. It was a decision Scotland's Justice Secretary said he knew many people would disagree with, and he was right. Abdel Basset Al Magrahi, dressed in white, on his final uneasy steps to freedom. Terminally ill with prostate cancer, he was released on compassionate grounds by Scotland's justice minister. A decision met with outrage at the highest levels. We we have been in contact with the Scottish government, uh, in indicating uh, that we objected to this, and uh, we thought it was a mistake. 270 people died in the Lockerbie bombing. 189 of them Americans. After a massive investigation and lengthy trial, McGraw, was the only person convicted. Jack and Kathleen Flynn lost their 21-year-old son, John Patrick, in the bombing. The word compassion should never be used in the same sentence with Mr. McGraw. Bert Ammerman lost his brother, Tom. It's as bad as the first day when we found out my brother was on the flight. Scotland's Justice Secretary says he knows the bereaved will never forget, let alone forgive. But Scottish law allows terminally ill prisoners to be shown compassion, and that's what he did with McGrahi. No compassion was shown by him to them. But that alone is not a reason for us to deny compassion to him. The Justice Secretary consulted doctors who say McGrahi is not responding to treatment and has less than three months to live. Mr. Al McGrahi now faces a sentence imposed by a higher power. After boarding his flight home, McGrahi, who has always maintained he's innocent and was appealing his conviction, issued a statement. To those victims' relatives who can bear to hear me say this, they continue to have my sincere sympathy. This horrible ordeal is not ended by my return to Libya. It may never end for me until I die. There are those who support McGrahi's release. Jim Swire lost his daughter Flora on the flight. I think there should always be a place in any nation's behavior for some compassion. An innocent dying man or mass murderer set free, McGrahi's release leaves many doubts about whether justice has been served. But when he arrived home in Tripoli tonight wearing a dark suit, hundreds of cheering supporters were waiting for him. It was expected McGrahi would be celebrated on his return to Libya. Most people there don't think he's guilty, think he was a scapegoat, and few seem to be heeding the State Department's warning that his return be kept low-key, that he not be made into a hero. Anne? All right, Donna Friesen tonight. Donna, thank you for your reporting on this story. In other news, a secret CIA plan has come to light that puts the controversial private security contractor Blackwater back in the news. There are reports now that the CIA hired employees of Blackwater in 2004, intending to have them tr help track down and kill top al-Qaeda members. More on this tonight from our chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell. The firm that used to be called Blackwater was already under fire. Five of its guards are still awaiting trial on voluntary manslaughter charges for killing Iraqi civilians in Baghdad two years ago. A sixth pleaded guilty. Blackwater was ordered out of Iraq last January. The company changed its name to Z, but many of its guards were rehired by another security firm and are still guarding U.S. officials in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
while the renamed Blackwater is still being paid millions for air operations in Afghanistan and government use of its training camp in North Carolina. Why would the CIA outsource a top-secret operation to what many call a rogue company? We really should be focusing on why can't the U.S. government put together a program to find these, these terrorist kingpins and take them out in a legal way, uh, and, and that's really the issue. Officials say Blackwater helped train agents to track al-Qaeda in places like London and Paris, outside of war zones, but quickly ran into diplomatic roadblocks. The idea that we would give contractors the authority to use lethal force abroad in friendly countries where there could be enormous blowback, as the CIA likes to say, uh, strikes me as, as crazy. Still unclear what role, if any, this man played, Kofor Black, in charge of counterterrorism for the CIA and then the State Department for three years after 9-11. Who hired him when he left? Blackwater. Tonight, Blackwater, operating under its new corporate name, did not respond to requests for comment. The company and its former CEO are still under federal grand jury investigation in North Carolina for potential crimes in Iraq. But today, former CIA director Michael Hayden defended the outsourcing. We do not use contractors to carve out something we, do, we want to deflect responsibility for. That is simply wrong. Still, critics say the CIA was trying to protect its reputation by hiring contractors to do its dirty work. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News, Washington. Today was Election Day in Afghanistan, and all eyes were on voter turnout after repeated threats from the Taliban that would stop at nothing to disrupt the election. Our chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, is in Afghanistan and reports from Kabul on what happened. Richard? Good evening, Ann. There were 135 attacks across Afghanistan today. 26 people were killed, and all of the violence and threats from the Taliban scared away many voters. At Kabul's Wazir Akbar Khan Mosque, voters only trickled in. Taliban threats and attacks kept many away, especially in militant strongholds in eastern and southern Afghanistan. In Helmand, 11 rockets exploded near polling stations, and militants attacked a police station outside Kabul. Nearby, some Afghans said they feared the Taliban would slit their throats if they voted. Low turnout in southern Afghanistan and Kabul could hurt the frontrunner, President Hamid Karzai. There, his base of support. Karzai is relying on voters like Nebi, a 35-year-old day laborer. In his one-room home in Kabul, he told us he's willing to defy the threats for his children. I'm voting for the peace and stability of my country, he said. But when Nebi arrived at the center, he was the only one voting. Turnout was high in the relatively safe north and west of Afghanistan. Here, many back Karzai's main rival, his former foreign minister, Abdullah Abdullah. High turnout in the north improves Abdullah's chances of forcing Karzai into a runoff election this fall. So as ballots were being counted tonight, it seems today's violence and intimidation didn't stop the vote, but may have inadvertently guaranteed another election. Both Karzai and Abdullah called today's election imperfect, but nonetheless successful. Initial results could come as early as Saturday. And All right, Richard Engel tonight in Afghanistan. Thanks so much, Richard. Senator Edward Kennedy has been battling cancer for more than a year now, but there was news today that made it clear that he has not stopped looking ahead. Kennedy has been senator since 1962, and now he wants to do something about how his successor will be chosen. The story tonight from NBC's Kelly O'Donnell in our Washington bureau. Hey, Kelly. Good evening, Ann. It's 15 months now into his battle with brain cancer, and Senator Edward Kennedy made a significant political move. He sent the message that it is okay to begin a public conversation about the future of the Senate seat he's held almost 47 years. Senator Kennedy, the longtime sailor, still heads out to sea. And Kennedy, the longtime public servant, has begun to chart a new course. In this letter to the Massachusetts governor and top legislators of both parties, Kennedy urged a change in state law, saying, As I look ahead, I am convinced that enabling the governor to fill a Senate vacancy through an interim appointment followed by a special election would best serve the people of our Commonwealth. 
Right now, the law says a vacant seat would remain empty for about five months until a new election. The Massachusetts governor lost the power to fill a Senate vacancy during the presidential race in 2004, when state legislators feared that if Democrat John Kerry had won, Republican Governor Mitt Romney would have named the successor. Today, Massachusetts Republicans don't want another change. The law should be the law, the rules should be the rules, and everybody should play by them. Kennedy advisors say the senator's request is motivated by his passion to see health care reform passed. And in a razor-close vote, one vacant seat could make the difference. What Kennedy has done with this letter is to make it feasible, indeed necessary, for other people to talk about a succession plan that they would have been too embarrassed to do if he hadn't raised it himself. And Anne, today, aides stressed that the timing of Kennedy's letter is not a sign that his health has suddenly deteriorated. The senator never even mentioned his cancer in the sometimes emotional letter. And aides also tell me that Kennedy's wife, Vicki, has no interest in being considered for his seat. Anne? All right, Kelly O'Donnell tonight. Kelly, thanks. President Obama was pitching health care reform again today, including an appearance on a conservative radio talk show. He was asked about the back and forth this week over government-run public option component, which White House officials seemed to back away from earlier in the week. The press got uh, a little excited, and some folks on the left got a little excited about this. Our position hasn't changed. We think that the key is cost, control, competition, making sure that people have good quality options. If we're able to achieve that, uh, that's the end that we're seeking. The president went on to say he believes that no matter how it's achieved, change has to happen, calling the status quo unsustainable. There was word from Washington that the cash for clunkers program will end on Monday, just four days from now. The popular multi-billion dollar program, which has already been extended once, is coming to the end of the road less than five weeks after it began. NBC's Tom Costello now joins us from Washington with more on this. Tom. Hi, and good evening. It's likely to be a busy weekend at dealerships. Car owners can get up to $4,500 for trading in a clunker for a new, more fuel-efficient car. Well, at 8 p.m. Eastern time on Monday, all that application paperwork must be submitted. The program comes to an end. Sounds good. Thanks for buying a Westfield Ford. Thank Colin, you. it's one of the most successful short-term economic stimulus Thanks, programs. The White House today said it's time to start winding down its Cash for Clunkers program. It has been successful beyond anybody's imagination. Dealers and the government have been overwhelmed. As of today, the Cash for Clunkers program has recorded more than 457,000 dealer transactions worth $1.9 billion in rebates. The benefits are really twofold. It's gotten the consumer back into the showroom, it's gotten dealerships in better financial condition, and of course it's helped the manufacturers as well. But the government admits it's processed fewer than half the rebate applications, and many must be resubmitted by 8 p.m. Monday after the forms were filled out incorrectly. All of it leaving most participating dealers out thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars as they wait to get paid. Let me go and get the key. In Sarasota, John Taberski has sold some 50 cars under the program. We have well over a quarter million dollars right now uh, invested. So uh, we're, we think that uh, hopefully soon, you know, we'll, we'll start to get some more of that money. You know, we're confident that the government's going to come through, but they've just been a little bit slow. Again today, the president insisted the dealers will get their money. I think this is actually a high-class problem to have, that we're selling too many cars too quickly, and there's some backlog in the application process. It is getting fixed. Of the $3 billion budgeted for this program, the government has only paid out $145 million. Critics say the government should not be involved in this kind of a program of buying used cars. They call it a giveaway. And back to you. All right, Tom Costello tonight. Tom, thanks. When Nightly News continues on this Thursday evening, big and dangerous Hurricane Bill is churning in the Atlantic and is threatening big waves and riptides all along the East Coast. And later, the kids who are bringing new meaning to the term Victory Garden, making a difference for themselves and their neighbors. Hurricane Bill continues to churn in the Atlantic, though it's not expected to make landfall. Still, strong waves and dangerous ripped currents are predicted along much of the East Coast for the next several days. At the moment, this big storm is heading towards Bermuda, and Jim Contoria of the Weather Channel is in Bermuda for us tonight. Hey, Jim. Hey, good evening, Ann. If you look at Bermuda, it's only about 20 square miles. 
it's shaped like a small J with a dot on the top of it, and that dot is where the airport is. So getting from the main part of the island over to the airport will be nearly impossible with some of that wave action tomorrow. Already, within 48 hours of its closest point, you can see some of the huge waves that are already coming in and running up the beach and beginning the erosion process. The beach that I'm standing on here will not be here when this storm goes on by. The evacuation process here is basically for people that want to leave the island. The airport's going to be shut down when we get aircraft in tomorrow, and then once it leaves, that will be it by Friday afternoon. Two cruise ships that were supposed to leave Saturday are leaving a day early, so vacationers coming to Bermuda are getting their vacation cut short. These waves are heading to the East Coast. Back to you. All right. Thanks for the warning, Jim Cattori, this tonight with more on that. Okay, and here's something to keep in mind this hurricane season. The government said today that this summer's average global ocean temperatures are the warmest they've been, been since record keeping began in 1880. Some of that is because of the natural El Nino effect, and some is being attributed to global warming. The warm water temperatures feed hurricanes, but for swimmers, it's a paradise. The water temperature in Maine this week was a balmy 72 degrees. When nightly news continues this evening, tough new rules for credit card companies and what that means for you. News on the economy tonight. The foreclosure numbers are getting worse. The Mortgage Bankers Association said today the percentage of loans either past due or in foreclosure reached a record 13.2 percent in the second quarter of this year. And in addition, more than half the delinquent loans were prime mortgages, evidence that the crisis has gone beyond subprime borrowers. The first phase of a new set of rules for credit card companies went into effect today, part of an effort to protect consumers from some practices Congress said were unfair. NBC's Trish Regan now joins us with more on this. Hey, Trish. Hi, Ann. You know, we've already seen credit card companies raise rates ahead of today's changes. Hopefully that will begin to stop. Now, beginning today, credit card companies are going to have to mail your bill out 21 days before it's due. This will essentially give consumers an extra week to to avoid any late charges. The other big change, and they must give you 45 days notice before they raise your interest rate. However, this only applies to fixed rate cards, not to variable rate cards, and the majority of cards out there are actually variable rate. Now, consumers should also know they have the right to reject an increase in their rate and pay off an existing balance at the current rate. Additional changes are coming in February of 2010. Some of those include the fact that credit card companies are going to have a whole lot harder to time marketing to college students because anyone under the age of 21 is going to need a co-signer for a card. Finally, one of the biggest changes that will happen next year is that banks will only be able to raise your rate on existing balances if you're 60 days late. Still, Ann, I want to point out that this bill does not prevent the credit card companies from simply shutting off your card altogether or from actually limiting your amount to credit. Now, banks are saying they need to have that flexibility to shut off cards or to reduce credit limits, given that the economy is in such a tough state. That's a lot of change, Trish Regan. Thanks so much for making it clear for all of us. On Wall Street today, stocks gained more ground. The Dow finished the day up just under 71 points. When we come back, these are not your garden variety teenagers, but they have planted seeds that are making a difference. If you worry about America's young people, you need to see our next story. It's about teenagers sowing the seeds of hope for people in need. And NBC's Carrie Sanders reports from Palm Beach County, Florida, they are making a difference. This is a garden of lemongrass, rosemary, hot peppers, and basil, where seeds planted this summer by a group of unlikely teenage farmers sprouted something more than vegetables and herbs. There's a bumper crop of confidence. It's fun, and now I see that anything is possible. Did you think that you would be this successful? Not at all, especially not at 15 years old. On a small plot of land, in a neighborhood where 86% of the residents live at or below the poverty line, some of the older kids at the Boys and Girls Club in Palm Beach County wanted to earn money. And we sent out a parent survey. Most parents said they struggled putting food on the table. Radish? Yes. I'll take the mango. So we decided to build our business on giving healthy and nutritious food at very low cost. And boy, did it take off. 
Here's another cabbage. Now, this is the kind of shopping I like. <laughs> you just tell them what you want and put it in there. For $30. Lettuce, cabbage, string bean. Shoppers at the Rise and Shine Co-op leave with at least double what they'd get at the grocery. That's 96, 12 times 96. 8. To meet demand, the kids supplement their garden buying wholesale. They're seeing the whole cycle. And I mean, that just broadens their horizon. It's a real business with real dollars, but the Excel spreadsheet does not reveal the whole story. It's not all about making money, it's helping others that really don't have it. Tomatoes, yes. Oh, cucumbers. My budget is very tight, and uh, this makes, uh, makes it a lot easier for me. Good morning! Quietly guiding the kids, there are mentors. They will tell you, every one of them, that they're going to be successful. And you say? And I say, they're going to be successful. And I'm going to say, I knew them when. A business growing profits beyond any balance sheet. Onions? Yes. Carrie Sanders, NBC News, Palm Beach County, Florida. That's our broadcast for this Thursday night. I'm Ann Curry, and for Brian Williams, and for all of us here at NBC News, thank you and good night.